While Songi was at its height in the 16th century, Europeans were constructing fortifications along the West African coast. Though the major centers of population and prosperity lay in the African interior, the Portuguese, French, English, and others were finding a way to redirect West African trade to the coast, focusing on the commodity in which they were soon most interested, slaves. The economic geography of West Africa slowly moved from the interior toward the coast. While the process was gradual and while connections across the Sahara Desert and the Indian Ocean continued, Africa's international connection was now shifting toward the Atlantic Ocean and beyond to the Americas. European occupation of the Americas, the continuing decline of American populations, and new trade links with West Africa sets the stage for the rise of the Atlantic plantation system. It is important to understand how the Europeans obtained slaves in Africa. The Europeans did not land in Africa and capture Africans in nets. Instead, different African tribes warred against each other and captured their neighbors. The victorious tribes would then sell the captured Africans to the Europeans. Millions of Africans were transported to the Americas and enslaved on plantations by Europeans who reaped huge fortunes. This is a map of the African slave population. Some slaves were taken north across the Sahara Desert to Arab countries. That had been a traditional part of old empires. Slavery was never permanent. It might just be for a number of years. However, the lines of Africans going to Europe as well as the Americas were different. They tended to be in perpetuity. Very few would be set free. Millions in the Americas plantation regions were completely transformed. Imported plants and animals replaced indigenous ones and Africans became a predominant population as planters systemized the production of sugar and related products like molasses and rum on an industrial scale. When the Spanish conquered the Caribbean islands, they first tried to exploit Amerindians who refused to cooperate and soon fell victim to the deadly diseases the Europeans brought with them. Later, European indentured servants, servants that were white Europeans that served five to seven years and then would be set free, would become vulnerable to these tropical diseases such as yellow fever and malaria that had been brought from Africa. When sugar became the sole focus of West Indian agriculture, neither European nor Amerindian labor proved sufficient. Therefore, import more African slaves. African slaves filled the void. They were expensive, but they could survive the Caribbean environment. As natives of the Old World, they had developed resistance to the same diseases as Europeans. And as natives of the tropics, they were also more resistant to tropical diseases. Tragically, their ability to survive enhanced their value as slaves. Under such harsh conditions, many Africans were worked to death. Barbados is representative. In 1680, there were 50,000 African slaves on the island. Over the next 40 years, another 50,000 slaves were imported, but the total black population actually dropped to 45,000. Slave populations were not self-sustaining. The mortality rate was high and the birth rate was low. However, in the Americas, Jamestown, England's first permanent settlement in the Americas, eventually became a tobacco plantation system. While the east, the coastal areas of the Carolinas grew rice, you did not have to import a large number of slaves into the, the present day United States. The populations tend to be more healthy because there wasn't tropical disease and they could raise their own families. Slaves were constantly looking for ways to escape their bondage and failing that to resist their captivity in large or small ways. Slave traders, owners, and overseers were ever vigilant and the penalties for insubordination were gruesome. 
Slaves often found safer, more subtle ways to assert their humanity and express their defiance. Songs and stories derived from African culture traditions might be used to ridicule a master using words he could not understand. Religious rites, African Christian or a synthesis of multiple belief systems and rituals might serve as assertions of dignity and spiritual resilience. Expressions of deference to the slave master might be deceiving. Already in the 16th century, Africans were banding together to form maroon communities. Perhaps the best known was Palmares in northeastern Brazil. This was mentioned in the previous chapter. Palmares was unique in scale, but smaller maroon communities were common in the Caribbean. Some of the islands were too small for maroons to successfully avoid recapture, but the interior mountains of Jamaica were the perfect for that purpose. When the Spanish fled Jamaica in 1655 during a British attack, they left behind hundreds of African slaves who headed for the hills. Free, these maroons farmed, fished, and occasionally pillaged British sugar plantations on the coast. Their threat to the British came not so much from raiding, but from the sanctuary that they could provide to other escaped slaves. After several slave uprisings in the early 18th century, the British increased their attacks on the Maroons. The British and Maroons fought to a stalemate, leading to a treaty that allowed the Maroons autonomy in exchange for the promise that they would hunt, capture, and return future runaways. In Jamaica today, the mountainous interior still is home to an indigenous Maroon population that has semi-autonomy against the current government of Jamaica. Also in parts of Florida, escaped slaves formed an alliance with Creek and Seminole Indians. They became known as the Black Seminoles and adopted many elements of the Native American cultures. Also another way for slaves to resist were through work slowdowns, a common form of rebellion. Religion is perhaps the area where Africans could best resist enslavement without risking flight or outright rebellion. Where Africans were great in number, their religious practice showed the greatest continuity. In both Brazil and Cuba, for example, Africans merged their existing belief with Christianity, transforming the Orsas, gods of the Yoruba people, into Catholic saints. Zango, the Yoruba deity of thunder and lightning, is still venerated today in the Cuban and Brazilian synthesis of Catholicism and African religion called Santeria and Condenoble. It's very similar to the Haitians and their ideas of voodoo. Some places encourages an act of Christian charity. Of course those most likely to be freed were women, children, and the elderly. Adult male Africans had little chance of attaining freedom through a simple act of charity. In colonial Latin America, persons were free unless proven otherwise. Black men who escaped their masters and moved far enough away might pass as free men. In British North America, however, manumissions were uncommon and legal codes made little or no distinction between the free blacks and slaves.